Gene Kim has written a couple of books. You know, probably a lot of you remember the Phoenix Project. It was super exciting to people a few years ago, and and now he's got his new one out, the Unicorn Project. Which you know, at Halloween time, you should have read it. It's a spooky story. <laughs> I, I know you didn't mean it that way, Gene, but but it is like it was frightening. Um, but at any rate, Gene's going to talk to us about some really uh, cool stuff about the five ideals of DevOps. So, uh, Gene, go ahead and share your screen and uh, take it away. First, okay. I want to say uh, just how much fun I've had talking uh, with Arthur over the last few months about our similar journeys, uh, coming to understand the true value of automated uh, testing. That is far more than about automating testing. It really reveals our ability or inability to quickly integrate testing into our daily work. And it's one of the most important requirements to create you know, all the amazing outcomes that we talk about in DevOps. If you can't do automated testing, it often reveals huge problems with the architecture of our code, which not only hinders our ability to create high quality software that works as expected, but also hinders our ability to deliver software quickly and reliably, as well as change our software over time. Um, so uh, I've been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and that was a journey that started back when I was a CTO and technical founder of a company called Tripwire in the information security and compliance space. Um, and I will show my slides in about two minutes. Um, and so um, uh, we want to specifically study those amazing organizations that simultaneously had uh, the best project due date performance and development. They had the best uh, operational reliability and stability uh, in uh, operations, as well as the best posture of security and compliance. So we want to understand how did those amazing uh, organizations create those amazing outcomes so that we could understand how other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And so as you can imagine, in a 23-year journey, there were many surprises. But by far, the biggest surprise was how it took me into the middle of the DevOps movement. Uh, the last time that any industry has been disrupted to the extent that all our industries are being disrupted today was likely manufacturing in the 1980s, when it was upended when Toyota entered the uh, uh, the US marketplace uh, to the uh, detriment of uh, most American manufacturers, uh, automotive manufacturers. So I think that's exactly what DevOps is. You take those same lean principles, apply them to the technology value stream that we work in every day, and we end up with these emergent patterns that allow organizations to do tens, hundreds, even hundreds of thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability. And you certainly can't do that if you don't automate key parts of your process uh, like testing. So I've mentioned uh, DevOps several times. So here's the definition of DevOps that we put into uh, the DevOps handbook. We said specifically, it is the architectural practices, technical practices, and cultural norms that enable us to increase our ability to deliver applications and services quickly and safely. This enables rapid experimentation and innovation, as well as the fastest possible delivery of value to our customers, while ensuring world-class security, reliability, and stability so that we can win in the marketplace. Um, so I love that definition because it doesn't actually say what DevOps is, but it does describe the, what the outcomes that we aspire to are. But as much as I love that definition, there's a definition that I love even more, and it comes from my friend John Smart, who led the ways of working at Barclays, a bank founded in the year 1635. And his definition was simply this. It is better value sooner, safer, and happier. So I love this definition for uh, many reasons, but here's two. One, it's shorter than the definition I gave you, and yet just as accurate. Two is it's so difficult to object to. Uh, in other words, the, even your biggest DevOps skeptic, even your uh, person who doesn't believe in automated testing would not claim that they want less value later with more danger and more misery. So I think it does a wonderful job in describing what we're trying to do when we want, uh, say we're trying to do things in a more DevOpsy like way. And so, uh, as Arthur mentioned, uh, the Phoenix Project came out in 2013, and I think there are still so many problems that still remain. One is the absence of understanding of all the invisible structures required to truly unleash developer productivity. And maybe I should say, when I say developer, I mean all engineering productivity. Uh, there's this uh, orthogonal problem to DevOps around data. In other words, uh, the DevOps movement rightly pointed out that it took too much time, too much effort, and uh, took too, would create too much danger to get code to where it needed to go, which is in production, so that customers are saying thank you. Uh, there's other problems around data, where data is often trapped in systems of records or uh, data warehouses, and it takes too long uh, and, and uh, requires you know, too much risk to get it to where it needs to go, which is in the hands of people who make decisions, which is somewhere between 30 and 50% of anyone in an organization use or manipulate data in their daily work. There's often very strong opposition to support these newer ways of working, and there's ambiguity in terms of what behaviors we need from our leadership to support this type of transformation. And so these are the areas I want to explore more, and this is what uh, went into the, Phoenix Pro the Unicorn Project that came out in 2019. And so uh, in this presentation, I'll describe uh, the five ideals. I'll describe what ideal looks like, not ideal, uh, what that looks like, and how one can go from one to the other. 
But before that, I want to uh, take a moment to substantiate this claim uh, that I had made that DevOps is urgent and important because it enables business value. And so this is uh, what went into the state of DevOps research that I was able to do with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble. Uh, uh, in the state of DevOps research, that I, were, I was able to collaborate with them from 2013 to 2019. And so this is a cross-population study. So with the cross-population instrument uh, is the same uh, instrument that the medical community used to establish a link between smoking and early morbidity or mortality. And so our uh, cross-population study was across 36,000 respondents uh, across six years. And we found that high performance exists and they massively outperform the non-high performing peers. And we know what behaviors lead to high performance. So let's talk about what those high performers do. They deploy more frequently uh, as measured by, um, they're deploying multiple times per day. So that's two orders of magnitude more frequently than their peers. More importantly, they can do those deployments far more quickly. They can do it in one hour or less. In other words, how quickly can they go from code being in version control through integration, through testing, through deployment, um, so it's running in production and customers are saying thank you. Again, this is two orders of magnitude faster than their peers. Uh, more importantly, when they do deployments, they're getting far better outcomes. Uh, they're seven times more likely to have those deployments succeed without causing a uh, several outage, a service impairment, uh, a uh, security breach or compliance failure. Uh, and Murphy's Law does exist. And so when uh, high performers uh, do deployments, when things go wrong, they can fix it far faster as measured by the mean time to restore service. They can fix it in one hour or less. And this is three orders of magnitude uh, faster than their peers. And so what we found over six years was very decisive. Uh, the only way to get these amazing reliability profiles is to do smaller deployments more frequently. So over the years, we looked at other dimensions of quality. We found that because high performers are integrating information security objectives into everyone's daily work, uh, they are only spending one half the amount of time remediating security issues. Uh, in 2015, uh, we started looking at organizational performance. We found that these high performers, in addition to having all these great uh, technical measures, they are also twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals for not-for-profits. Uh, we tested that two years later. Uh, same multiple of performance for government agencies, military services, not for profits. They were twice as likely to achieve organizational and mission goals, regardless of how they measured it, whether it was customer satisfaction, quantity, or quality. Other markers of organizational performance. In these high performers, employees were twice as likely to recommend their organizations as a great place to work as measured by the employee net promoter score. And so in this age where recruiting and retention are so important, you know, this metric is more important than ever. So beyond the numbers, uh, what does this suggest to me? It says these uh, show how um, DevOps helps us quickly, safely, reliably, securely achieve all the goals, dreams, and aspirations of the organizations that we serve. So what I'd like to do in the next uh, 25 minutes is share with you uh, the five ideals. Um, and the first one is locality and simplicity. And so uh, if the... Phoenix Project uh, was about one metric. It would be the bus factor. It's measured by how many people need to be hit by a bus or win the lottery and leave uh, before the project, service, or even or entire organization is in grave jeopardy. And so in the Phoenix Project, uh, the bus factor was one. In other words, it was Brent. If Brent got hit by a bus or won the lottery and left, then suddenly no outage could be fixed or no complex piece of uh, work could be performed because all the necessary knowledge was in Brent's head. And so uh, we, this is obviously not so great. Low, we want a higher bus factor. We want to be reliant not on an individual, but on a team or better yet, a team of teams. Um, so higher is better. So in the unicorn project, the corresponding metric would be the lunch factor. It's measured by, to get something important done, done, how many people do we need to take out to lunch? Is it the Amazon ideal of the two pizza team where every team no larger than can be fed by two pizzas can independently uh, develop, test and deploy value to customers and have them say thank you with dependencies on no one else? Or the opposite, so that's a nice low lunch factor, or do we have the opposite where for consider a large complex deployment that might involve hundreds of people, we might have to feed everyone hundreds of people for multiple days. Now, so this is obviously too high of a lunch factor. Um, also, consider if you are a uh, development team and you need to implement a feature. If you have dependencies on 43 different teams, now someone has to take 43 diff different people out to lunch, explain what you're trying to do, why it's important, and most importantly, what you need from them. And if any one of those 43 people say no, then suddenly you can't get done what needs to get done. Uh, and this is because of the too high lunch factor. 
And so this really um, leads to one of the biggest aha moments for me during the state of DevOps research, which was that architecture uh, is one of the top uh, predictors of performance. As measured by what? Uh, to what extent can teams make large scale changes to their parts of the system without permission from anyone else outside of their team? To what extent can teams do their work without a lot of fine-grained communication and coordination, again, with people outside of their team? To what extent can they deploy or release their service on demand, independent of services it may depend upon? And I love this last one. To what extent can teams do their own testing on demand without the use of a scarce integrated test environment, of which there are never enough of, uh, they're never cleaned up, which actually jeopardizes the test objectives? And if all those things are true, we should be able to do deployments during normal business hours with negligible downtime. And so this is a measure of to what degree are we coupled to other people in the organization, which is, uh, again, correlated with uh, the lunch factor. And just to explain uh, why this was such a big surprise, when I was at Tripwire, we were always trained to ignore architects or even uh, especially chief architects because everyone knew they didn't impact how daily work was performed. All they did was email visual diagrams out every couple of years, right? And then we'd go back to the Abbey Towers, never to be seen or heard from again for a couple of years. So that was just a polite way to say that they didn't impact how daily work was performed. And so if that were ever true, it's certainly not true now, because what this finding shows is there's just nothing that impacts performance more than architecture. And so in the ideal, anyone can implement what they need to by looking at one file, one module, one application, make all the changes there, and then be done. Not ideal is that to make your necessary changes, you have to understand change all the files, all the modules, all the applications, because uh, the functionality is smeared across too far of a too wide of a surface area. Again, driving up our lunch factor. But it's not just about implementation; it's also about testing. And the ideal changes can not only be independently implemented, but they can be independently tested isolated from the other components. So that's uh, part of the notion of composability. Not ideal is that for us to get any assurance that our changes will work as designed, we have to test it in the presence of every other component. Again, drawing us back to those integrated testing environments, uh, coupling us to potentially everybody else in the enterprise. Um, and so this leads to uh, just an, a huge professional aha moment, which is that I found that our inability to test our code often reveals large problems in our architecture. And when I'll explain about more about learning closure in 2016, but I learned then that I had been silently, inadvertently self-sabotaging everything I've written for 30 years, where my code tended to fall down like a house of cards because of something I didn't quite understand. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a concrete example. When I say for 30 years, I mean that literally. Uh, in 1995, um, part of our graduate school uh, project in compiler design was to build a module two compiler in C++ and to generate Spark assembly code. So we had to write the lexer, the parser, generate the ASTs, the intermediate representations, and then eventually generate the assembly code that we would compile with uh, uh, AS, right, which was the assembler uh, in SunOS. And it started off great because I'd used those tools before, but uh, I kept on tucking in each compilation phase into the next phase, thinking, Okay, here goes nothing. I'm putting my code somewhere where I can no longer access it. It felt like throwing it into a deep dark well. I just hope it works. And it did work for a little while. So uh, the, uh, the way the compiler was graded was that uh, we had to compile and then run the Spark assembly uh, programs and check the results and everything worked. <laughs> uh, I was quite proud until the recursive programs. Then I found that these kept on blowing up after some, a certain number of recursive calls. And I just ran out of time. I couldn't fix the mess that I created. I had to submit my sub fatally flawed compiler. Uh, I probably got one of the lowest uh, scores in the class. And it was only after learning closure in 2016 that I realized my mistake. You need to be able to independently run and test your code isolated from every other component. And so on the left, here's what I should have written, right? Each phase should have been run in sequence so that you could test them in isolation. And instead I was uh, basically having each phase call the next phase where I can no longer run or test each uh, phase in isolation. So I'll talk a little bit more about why that's so important. And I think one of the key themes about this conference is that you must be able to write code so that you can test it. So in the ideal, uh, not only does every team have the expertise and capability to do what the customer wants, but they have, they have to have the authority to do what the customer wants. Not ideal is that to get anything important done, every decision has to escalate up to, over to, and then down to, or visually depicted, uh, everything that goes up to, over to, and down to, just to allow two engineers to talk to each other, to collaborate, to do what the customer wants. And uh, often when we span divides between say dev and ops or dev and uh, QA, this is where you see you know, these terrible problems. So the first ideal is all about locality and simplicity. The second ideal is about focus, flow, and joy.
And so I had mentioned how uh, learning Clojure in 2016 uh, was one of the most difficult, uh, but yet illuminating things I've ever done. Uh, and make no mistake, it was one of the most uh, you know, challenging things I've ever had to learn. Um, and yet, again, it was so rewarding because it reintroduced the joy of coding back into my daily work. Uh, and I think the reason why I find it so fulfilling is that I learned how much you can do with so little effort these days because of all of the affordance that you know modern technology uh, uh, creates. For example, open source, all the amazing tooling. Um, and so in a good month, I'll spend half the time writing, half the time hanging out with the best in the game, of which this is definitely one of those, uh, as well as 20% of my time coding. So the French philosopher, uh, philosopher Claude Lévi-Strauss would say of certain tools, is it a good tool to think with? And I think there are so many great tools to think with that come from functional programming, of which Clojure is uh, part of the family of, and so uh, such as composability, which we talked a little about, uh, the notion of pure function and immutability. So these are concepts that were pioneered in programming languages, but they're such good tools to think with that they show up in infrastructure, operations, and data as well. And so uh, the notion of immutability is so powerful, the notion that once you create something, you should not be able to change it. And that is why uh, Docker is the way it is. If you want to make a persistent change to a container, you find that you can't, right? You have to make an entirely new one. And the world becomes so much simpler to reason about and to understand and predict how systems will behave you know, when you remove the ability to change things in production. Kubernetes applies that not just to the component level, but the entire system level. Whenever you see something like Apache Kafka or event streams, uh, it's because um, someone's thinking about an immutable data model where we're not allowed to change the past. Um, Databases are now increasingly immutable. Version control is immutable, which is why we get yelled at if we rewrite the commit history, because we shouldn't be allowed to change the past. So in the ideal, when we're using these better tools to think with, our best time and energy is spent focused on solving the business problem at hand, and we're having fun. So not ideal is that um, uh, we're spending all our time solving problems that we don't even want to solve. So uh, the biggest surprise for me was that all these things I may have enjoyed, for some definition of enjoyed, uh, and I now detest. I uh, Here's just a sampling of things that I detest. These, I hate everything outside of my application. I become one of those parochial selfish developers. I hate connecting anything to anything else because everything always takes a week. I hate updating dependencies because everything potentially breaks. I hate... Um, uh, updating dependency, uh, secrets management, authorization, authentication, data masking, bash, YAML, patching. Uh, I can't figure out why my cloud costs are so high. <laughs> so um, uh, what's amazing, uh, and by the way, I don't mean to diminish any of these activities because especially when it comes to security, uh, arguably these are as important as the feature I'm trying to build for myself. So, uh, but the amazing thing about being a developer these days uh, is that uh, we don't have to do these things. We don't have to open up a ticker, ticket and pester someone to get us what we need. Instead, we can get them on demand uh, with immediacy. So whether it's environment, deployment, automated testing, security scans, test with data management, all these things, we can get in the platforms that developers use in their daily work, which means we can get them immediately, which can give us fast feedback on our work, which enables focus and flow and even joy. And so flow uh, has a lot of connotations in the lean and manufacturing community, but there's a definition of flow that I love even more, and it comes from Dr. Mihaly Csikszent Mihalyi. He gave what I think is one of the best TED Talks of all time called Flow, The Secret to Happiness. His book, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, is just wonderful. And he describes flow as the state of mind when we are doing work that we love, that challenges us, that we lose track of time, or maybe even lose sense of self. This transcendental experience we have when we do work that truly uh, you know, challenges and rewards us. And we are often orders of magnitude more productive uh, when we're in a state of flow than, say, when we're being interrupted every 10 minutes. And you can't do this uh, if you're having to pester someone and try to get what you need. And so uh, before I leave this section, I want to share uh, a metric that looks very tactical, and yet I do believe it is one of the most strategic measures of any technology organization, and that is uh, the code deployment lead time. In other words, how quickly can we go from code committed and version control through integration, through tests, through deployment, so that customers are getting value? And one can reasonably ask, you know, uh, why do we start the lead time clock at code commit? Why don't we start it earlier when a feature goes into implementation in development, or maybe even earlier when an idea is first conceived? And the reason is that the even though those are valid lead time measures, 
the point of which changes are put in into version control divides the technology value stream into two very different parts. The first is product design and development. Um, so this is inherently experimental. Inherent, often we're doing work for the first time, maybe never again to be repeated. Uh, it doesn't take minutes or hours. It may often take weeks, months, or quarters. And so this is just the nature of design and development work. However, everything to the right of code committed is product build, test, and deploy. Uh, and here we want the exact opposite characteristics. We want these activities to happen quickly, reliably, entirely automated if possible. We don't want it to take uh, weeks or months. We need this to happen in minutes or hours. So code deployment, uh, simultaneously uh, lead time, simultaneously predicts how good are we at product build, test, and deploy, but also predicts how fast are we giving developers and all engineers feedback on their work. So if I uh, am a developer and I uh, introduce an error and I check into version control, if the first opportunity where I, when I can detect the error is nine months later during integration testing, the link between cause and effect is basically vanished. Right, uh, uh, so the mean time to find, mean time to fix, all terrible. What we want instead is the instant I check into version control, automated testing kicks in, and I should be notified within minutes, worst case hours, um, so I can find that mistake and fix it. And it's not just learning from errors, uh, it's about learning from customers. So I love this quote from Scott Cook, this is almost 15 years old, uh, the founder of Intuit, he said 15 years ago, by installing a rampant innovation culture, we did 165 experiments during the peak three months of our tax filing season. And so when I first read this quote, I was thinking, these people don't have no idea what they're doing. These people are idiots. Why would they make changes when it matters the most? Because the way I was trained in retailing, we were so afraid of the holiday outage that we had a change freeze from October 1 to January 30th. Why would these people make changes during peak seasons? And the answer is revealed in the next paragraph. He said, by doing this, we were able to increase the conversion rate of our customer acquisition funnel by 50%, right? And every, and every employees loved it because now their ideas are making it to market. So maybe the best time to do these type of experiments is during peak seasons. Um, but we can only do this if we can fearlessly make changes, confident that we will catch errors before it makes it into production, which reveals this other kind of wonderful finding from the state of DevOps research that said, there's actually one question you can ask that predicts with startling accuracy everything I've talked about so far, which is simply asking on a scale of one to seven, to what degree do we fear doing deployments? One is we have no fear at all, we just did one. Seven is we have an existential fear of doing deployments, uh, which is why in our ideal, uh, the next deployment we would do is never again. <laughs> it just shows how good the human brain is at associating fear with problematic activities. And so this is really gets to my thesis that test testability is more than just testing. Uh, as automated testing gives us fast feedback in our work. It creates a dynamic where we're getting small dopamine hits a couple of minutes and it gives us confidence in our changes. And uh, more importantly, without automated testing, the cost of testing increases linearly as we add more code. And this is death to any sort of project or service long-term. Michael Feathers in his wonderful book, Dealing Effectively with Legacy Code, has a simple definition of legacy code. It's any code that doesn't have automated testing. So uh, the first ideal is locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal is improvement of daily work. And I think this is very relevant to anyone who has to create automated testing where there is none right now. And the notion is that improvement of daily work is even more important than daily work itself. And so uh, not ideal might sound like twaddy, in other words, the way we've always done it. That obviously doesn't sound so good, so what does ideal sound like? It's MTBTT, uh, or make tomorrow better than today. And so this is principle number two from the Google SRE, uh, Site Reliability Engineering. And so especially as leaders, you know, who our entire job should be to make tomorrow better than today. And in our work, it really comes down to this, is that the greatness is never free, it is a decision. And, and our work is really comes down to often how we choose to pay down technical debt. And so let me tell you a story of where technical debt comes from, and I'm only going to use up and down arrows. So think of a time when you had to get to market quickly, sometimes to be first to market and get all the rewards that you reap when you are, or sometimes uh, you'll be happy just to be last to market because we're not even in the game yet. And so under those conditions, this really is all about the features. Uh, we are uh, we'll willing to cut corners, build up some technical debt and risks, uh, knowing that we will drive down quality and increase the number of defects that customers see. Uh, but the problem is, um, you know, this may have great uh, rationale, but when you fast forward in time, what invariably happens is the feature rate goes down and the amount of time that we spend working on defects go up, maybe even crossing over 100%. And these are the exact conditions where defects now dominate our daily work. 
reliability tanks, we go slower and slower, customers leave and engineers leave because everything that was once easy now seems impossible. And so my friend on Twitter, John Cutler, tweeted this at me. He said, exactly, in 2015, a certain reference feature would take 15 to 30 days to implement. Three years later, same class of feature, now takes 10 times longer. And so this is if this has happened to you, you're not crazy. This is exactly because of technical debt. And make no mistake, this can kill companies. One of uh, my favorite books I've read in the last uh, decade is Transforming Nokia by Risto Salasma. So he is the founder of F-Secure. Uh, he joined the board of Nokia in 2008, thinking that this was going to be the pinnacle of his career. Um, and it is this unflinching uh, look at his own performance as he was trying to change the board dynamics, but couldn't because of a very domineering board chairman. But my favorite um, uh, line in the book is when he described in 2010 how it felt when he learned from the VP of strategy that the build times for the Symbian OS operating system took 48 hours. He said it felt like it being hit in the head with a sledgehammer because he knew that if it took two days for any engineer to learn whether a change worked or would have to be redone, then all their hopes, dreams, and aspirations that were residing on Symbian OS was an illusion. And that's what actually drove them to uh, Windows Mobile, which arguably did not treat them so well either, but that was actually a far better bet than staying on Symbian OS. And so Nokia did not make it. Um, however, Every tech giant went through something similar, eBay, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Twitter, LinkedIn, Etsy, uh, and, but they made a very set of different set of decisions based on a different set of values. And I think the best example of this was the Microsoft security stand down in 2002. So this is uh, the famous summer of worms. Some of you may remember that uh, this is when basically every Microsoft product was being mown down because of security vulnerabilities. This is the summer of SQL Slammer, Code Red, Nimda, and so Microsoft famously went into a security stand down. For one year, every major Microsoft product went into a pro, um, feature freeze. And so Bill Gates sent this famous memo internally and published externally uh, about why they needed to do this. My favorite line is, if, if any developer has to choose between adding a feature or resolving a security issue, fix the security issue <laughs> because the survival of the company depends upon it. And this is what every one of those tech giants did. They all took features down to zero. They uh, had to pay down technical debt to invest in quality, to drive down defects, maybe not uh, to zero, but something that could sustain over time, reinvest in architecture to elevate developer productivity, often by orders of magnitude. And this is uh, often what created a new age of uh, uh, productivity and innovation for every one of these companies. And each one of these were driven by the CEO. But it's not just CEOs who talk about this, it's also product owners. This is Marty Kagan. Uh, he wrote the amazing book, Inspired, How to Create Products That Customers Love. He was the VP of Product Management at eBay in the early 2000s. And he learned that you must pay technical debt down as you go. You must take 20% of all engineering cycles off the table. They are not there for product. They are there for engineers to use however they best see fit to fix problematic areas of code, to automate, to refactor, to re-architect. Because what he learned at eBay was that because he did not ship a major feature in that two years he was there, and he said the only way to avoid that fate uh, is to pay technical debt down these go. If you don't pay your 20% tax, you will inevitably pay 100% tax. And you will be like, uh, you will leave uh, your organization, like he left eBay with no major features shipped. So uh, in the ideal, three to 5% of the best engineers are dedicated to improving other developers' productivity. Google famously has 1,500 developers just on dev productivity. That's a billion dollars of annual spend. Microsoft has multiples more than that. Not ideal. The only people working on dev productivity, automated testing, deployment pipelines are summer interns and people not good enough to be developers, right? And in fact, we want the other way around. We want our best engineers working on those issues. Uh, in a a uh, wonderful quote, uh, Sachin Della, now CEO of Microsoft, he said in a town hall meeting two years ago, he said, if any developer has to choose between working on a feature or working on their own productivity, work on your own productivity, because now we can use compounding interest in our favor versus technical debt, which is very much not. So uh, the first idea is locality and simplicity. The second idea is focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal is uh, improvement of daily work. And the fourth ideal is psychological safety. So uh, one of the best instruments of this uh, comes from Dr. Ron Westrom, who spent decades studying aviation safety, patient safety, uh, and what he found is in the best organizations, it was highly correlated with cultures. So in the worst organizations, he found these characteristics. Uh, we hide information because messengers of bad news are shot. We discourage bridging between teams. 
We cover up failures and new ideas are crushed. That doesn't sound so good. In the middle, he found bureaucratic cultures where we create processes to protect people, to mete out justice, which doesn't sound so bad, but it's not as good as generative cultures where we seek information. We train messengers to tell bad news. We uh, we share responsibilities because we know that InfoSec is not just InfoSec's job, just like quality uptime availability isn't just Ops's job or QA's job, it's everybody's job. When the failures happen, cause a genuine sense of inquiry and new ideas are welcomed. And so my area of passion since 2014 uh, is studying not so much the tech giants, um, the Facebook, Amazons, uh, Netflix, Google, Microsofts, but instead large complex organizations that have been around for decades or even centuries. And I'm so proud of the fact that uh, we've done our 16th conference. Uh, we've had nearly 1,500 leaders across 600 enterprise, across almost every industry vertical, sharing how they're using DevOps principles and practices to compete and win in the marketplace. And so I'm going to share with you some of my favorite uh, case studies. One of them uh, is from the Big Four Auditors. In 2019, we, uh, because most organizations, they said the biggest objection to modernizing technical practices was security, compliance, and external auditors and regulators. And so it was amazing to gather uh, a panel from each of the Big Four. These aren't the consultants. These are the assurance and attest side. And they're saying that uh, you know not only is DevOps possible to do in a secure, compliant, auditable way, uh, they need their clients to do this because they want their customers to still be around uh, in 10 years. Um, uh, in two weeks ago, we had Fernando Cornago, VP of Digital Technology at Adidas. Uh, uh, the story there started uh, in 2018 with a uh, at 2 a.m. by the elevators at an offsite in Germany where uh, 100 engineers were assigned to a new centralized services group uh, that were donated and <laughs> given from six business units, uh, betting that they would be able to benefit from the capabilities they could uh, create um, and share globally. Uh, six years later, uh, there are now thousands of engineers in digital technology trying to fulfill a goal where 50% of all Adidas revenue will come through direct consumer channels. And so it's just amazing. And for the first, he shared that for the first time uh, earlier this year uh, in e-commerce, they outgrew Nike for the first time in years, maybe even a decade. Um, one of my fake, favorite case studies also comes from Target. Uh, Luke Reddig, Senior Director of Merchandising Capabilities, uh, presented with his boss, Brett Craig, SVP of Digital, now CIO of Target, talking about how they were able to reverse the fortunes of the fresh foods division inside of Target uh, because of competition from Aldi, from Trader Joe's. If they couldn't improve performance, they would have to exit the market. And so what did they do about it? Uh, instead of putting 50 consultants uh, inside the division, uh, they parachuted in Luke Reddig and five engineers uh, and data engineers to try to figure out what would it take to give them the data they needed to uh, make better decisions. Uh, in a year, uh, gross margin increased to 40%. It became one of the best performing divisions inside of Target <laughs> and set the stage for a remarkable set of transformations inside of Target. So in the uh, DevOps community, we love talking about blameless postmortems. We love talking about chaos monkeys. None of this is possible uh, without psychological safety. So I'll end uh, with the last ideal uh, of customer focus. And I just want to share with you where this professional aha moment came from. So I'm visiting uh, Detroit, Michigan in 2019, January, uh, to visit Chris O'Malley, CEO of the famously resurgent mainframe vendor CompuWare, because we had learned so many things from him uh, over the years. I'm there with my buddy, uh, Dr. McKirsten, the author of Project to Product. And we're walking to the campus, and I look down at the agenda, and the first agenda item is a data center tour. <laughs> and I feel immediately embarrassed, thinking what are we possibly going to learn from seeing someone's halon extinguishers, which I've seen plenty of in my career. And yet what we saw in the data center uh, blew my mind, blew uh, all of our minds. Because what we saw in the uh, data center was 25,000 square feet of empty data center space. You look down on the ground, you see these green outlines where the server racks used to be. Uh, so it's like a, uh, like a crime scene in a TV show. Um, you, inside of each uh, green outline is a tombstone that describes what business process or what application used to run there and how much money they save by getting rid of it or moving it to a SaaS vendor. You see a sign that says over 18 tons of obsolete equipment removed and recycled, sent to a better place. And the reason why I think this is so, so you'll see things like Amia Financials, on-prem email, desktop backup. 
the reason why I think this is amazing is that this is one of the best demonstrations of moving context uh, to core. So Dr. Joffrey Moore defines core as the core competencies of the organization that create lasting, durable business advantage that customers are willing to pay us money for. Um, context is everything else. So context is often mission critical, like payroll systems. We have a, an obligation to pay our employees on time, correctly, accurately, and so forth. But customers are not willing to pay us extra money just because we have world-class payroll systems. And so that picture before showed $8 million of context that customers didn't care about uh, being reinvested into R&D, which customers absolutely do. So not ideal is that functional silo managers prioritize silo goals over the most important business goals. Uh, not, which is not so good. Ideal is that everyone should look at the work that they're doing at every given point in time and ask, does this create lasting durable business advantage that uh, customers are willing to pay us extra money for? And the answer is, if the answer is no, then we should be able to unflinchingly ask, should we be doing this work at all? Uh, or is this something that uh, we can move to a vendor because it's their core competency, not ours, and we're happily willing to pay us money uh, to get access to that? So uh, why do I think this is important? I, I love this quote. It's, the world is changing very fast. It is not big beating the small anymore. Instead, it is fast beating the slow. And uh, I think the corollary here is that the only thing better than being fast is fast and big. <laughs> so uh, the five ideals are re really meant to embody five concepts that I think are important to get us from here to there. And so if you're interested in these slides, uh, the Parasoft team will certainly send them to you. If you're interested in anything I've written, all the presentations from DevOps Enterprise Summit and excerpts of anything I've written, including the book coming out next year that I'm working on with uh, Dr. Steven Spear, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, subject line DevOps, and you will get an automated response uh, in a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. And Arthur, I'd love to turn it over back to you.